on the day when King was murdered, I had what I have to call now a premonition. All day long, something felt wrong to me. And I sat in my room in our House of Studies for Philosophy in St. Louis, and not, it just seemed off. And I went downstairs after dinner to get a magazine out of the reading room, and I heard the news bulletin that interrupted the TV show that everybody else was watching in the next room and said that Martin Luther King was shot on a motel balcony in Memphis, details to follow. And I went back upstairs and I laid down on the bed and I put together my premonition. I've been listening to the radio off and on and, and it has, the items just struck me as, okay, what? And then the last piece of information fell into place and I got up from my bed, and I wrote this poem, which is written in the style of one of those little news breaks that we have on television and the radio now. Willard Wirtz, Secretary of Labor, supports Humphrey, the news says. Over in central Illinois, the Big Muddy was reported to crest safely under flood level. Because of recent heavy rain, snow flurries with slight precipitation were predicted for St. Louis. Johnson received an ovation in St. Patrick's Cathedral. A late bulletin announced that Martin L. King was shot to death tonight on a balcony in Memphis. There were 3,238 Viet Cong killed last month by Allied forces. Mrs. Mabel Burnham won $630 in the KXOK Easter Egg Contest. The Pope still declines to make a statement on birth control. 4th April, 1968. And what bothers me this afternoon is that somehow by our inattention, neglect, or fear, we run the risk of submerging King into yesterday's news. Because of very special people who offered the invitation, I came here today, though I normally resist celebrating Martin Luther King Day in January, because it has frustrated me that we keep harping on the dream. His I have a dream speech, the last three paragraphs we hear all the time, is not what got him killed. What got him killed was asking America to wake up from its nightmare. If you listen or watch, rather, the full video of his night before he died speech, I've seen the promised land. It is obvious what we have learned subsequently, that he had already been told, you do not have long to live. And yet, he taught us in his passing from us something we don't want to pay attention to. Father Landon, being as perceptive as he is, leaned over to me just a few minutes ago and said, you just changed your talk, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. <laughs> during the presentation of that most deserved and well-earned award. I want to read this to you. A man found him wandering in the countryside and asked him, what are you looking for? I am looking for my brothers, he replied. Please tell me where they are pasturing their flock. The man answered, they have moved on from here. Indeed, I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him in the distance and, there, and before he reached them, they made a plot to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to one another. Come on. Let us kill him now and throw him down one of the storage wells. We can say that some wild animal has devoured him. Then 
we shall see what becomes of his dreams. I picked as the theme for this day, transforming the Jericho Road. But as I was sitting at that table listening to the remarks about this incredible effort and the appropriate and prophetic humility with which the reward award was received by who the true recipients are and the work that's being done, there was another Bible story that came to my mind, and it fits. And if it doesn't, I will make it fit. Because <laughs> that's what I do. Three strangers appeared where Abram was tending his flocks, and he made them welcome. He was hospitable, and they told him, you shall have a child, and that child's descendants shall be numberless as the sand on the shore. And we know that the story tells us that his wife hiding behind the tent flap, laughs because she was old and knew that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but we remember the real story of Abram, how his wife had said years before, since I shall never have children, why don't you take my Egyptian slave and bear a son so that you can have an heir? And as soon as she delivered Isaac, she said, you got to get rid of that woman and that baby because now mine has precedence and priority, primacy in your life. Now, the way that story gets told in some scriptures, the brothers were forever enemies. But doesn't that seem to be the story in so many of those great myths? The brothers were enemies. And if we are to wake America up from its nightmare now, we've got to go back to that primal moment. And we've got to remember the injunction that has been laid upon most of us in this room. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you do afflict them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn. And I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. You shall not harm any. And it continues on in every faith tradition in this room. We know what is wrong. We have become mute, resigned to the inevitable. How do we make adjustments for that which we cannot change? That's not the prophetic witness of the great leaders. If Rabbi Heschel's legs were praying, if the other old lady said, my feet are tired, but my soul is rested. If the old and the young could, for a reason, sing, we shall overcome. The hose, the dog, the whip, the billy club, the gun. Why have we become a community that adjusts itself to charity? That's not honoring King. That's not honoring our own mothers and fathers. That's not honoring the founders of this university. And that is certainly not handing honor on to our children. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, there was a man who went traveling and he went down to Jericho 
and he came upon a man who had been harmed by robbers. You know the story. King knew the story. The night before he died, he told the story again. I'm going to read both versions of the story and make a few remarks. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and through this throw him off base. Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate, but Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. And he talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember? that a Levite and a priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. And finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast, decided not to be compassionate by proxy. But with him administered first aid and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying, this was the good man. This was the great man because he had the capacity to project the I into the vow and to be concerned about his brother. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. At times, we say they were busy going to church meetings and ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get on down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for that meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who was engaged in religious ceremonials was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we begin to wonder whether maybe they were not going down to Jerusalem or down to Jericho, rather to organize a Jericho Road Improvement Association. <laughs> That's a possibility. Maybe they felt it was better to deal with the problem from the causal route rather than to get bogged down with an individual effort. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me, King says. It's possible that these men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem, we rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as a setting for the parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 feet above sea level, and by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the Bloody Pass. And you know it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over at that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking. He was acting like that he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them there for quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question for you. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers. Remember, he was in Memphis fighting for union rights. What will happen to all the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? If I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? Now, the reason he got killed, 1967, Riverside Church, he stands up and says it's time to break the silence about this war in Vietnam. Black folks turned against him. You don't need to be up there just drawing trouble and, and, and forgetting about civil rights. You don't need to be talking about all that. You need to keep your mind on business. And all the other people said, now see, I told you he was a communist. He's unpatriotic talking about the war. You got to be patriotic. You got to be for the war. My, that was 1967. Ain't that something? He says in that speech, 
I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside. But that will be only an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. That's what got him killed. And we dishonor him if we pick a coin up and start to throw it in charity. Oh, feed them. Run the food bank. Collect the clothes. But remember this. We are in a building on a piece of land brought here by some folks who said a long time ago, everybody deserves an education. And those who are excluded by the people in power, we got to make sure if we got to do it ourselves, we will do it. They built an institution that's not charity. That's a revolution in what passed for values in the heartland. And you've got the children of Abraham sitting here, all of us. And we finally get to rewrite the story so that sisters and brothers are not being displaced and treated like strangers and aliens among us. For every single one of us, if we want to tell the truth, has been treated like that. We are the margin coming together to make the circle. Quit changing the channel during the political season. Listen to what's being said. It's demonic. It's demonic. You cannot tell me, and you should not say it, but we got people who just don't know no better. This is a nation built on Christian values. All of us Native Americans and African Americans say, oh, really? Uh, you to Adam and you to Eve. Well, where were we in the Garden of Eden? When we want, to, we want to return to traditional family values. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Not when my mother came onto this earth, the product of a rape of a white man on a 16-year-old black girl. Whose traditional family values are you talking about? I have to say what I have to say because my grandmother couldn't say it. Who is your grandmother? Who is your grandchild? Who is your sister and who is your brother? The one laying by the side of the road. And King has told us that. I said at the table, I don't like saying we shall overcome because it's an excuse and a distraction too often. We're gonna finish up here today and we're gonna sing, we shall overcome and go home.
Not on my watch, you won't. (laughs) There is a song you could sing. And I think all of our traditions kind of got a claim on it if you want it. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Now, imagine with me how that song is constructed. Whoever's singing it is an elder. Children, wade in the water. Whoever's singing it is on the other side. Saying, come on now, you can do this. You can, come on now, wade in the water, children. And I'm going to tell you something. As soon as you get out there, it's going to wind up making you feel like you're going to drown. You're going to panic. You're going to be scared. You're going to flail. So why don't y'all hold on to each other's hands? Because your life is demanding that you get into trouble, not avoid it by some simple exercise of being, as he said so eloquently, compassionate by proxy. Somebody else will take care of this problem. You know better. You know urgently better. So what are we going to do? Death penalty. You want respect for life? Find out why one of the fastest growing industries in this country that's displacing education everywhere is the prison system. Tell me how, tell me how we have made progress since King got killed when schools in this country are underfunded and more segregated than any time in my lifetime. That's not progress. This is not an oasis that keeps us safe from harm. If we don't wade into God's trouble, somebody else's trouble is going to drown us. And we cannot afford that because our children are looking at us to tell them how to make safe passage through the trouble. Well, how are they ever going to learn that if you don't get out there and show them how to do it? So what is our commitment today? I want everybody in this room to understand. We got to stop belonging to organizations and institutions, and I hope this is on tape. We gotta stop (laughs) belonging to organizations and institutions that have the audacity and the arrogance to tell any child of God, you're not fully human. King was not motivated by we shall overcome alone. Somebody way back when picked up a little baby, no matter how the baby got here, and said, anybody ask you who you are, who you are, who you are? Anybody ask you who you are? You tell them you're the child of God. Well, what a revolution of values. Who are the legitimate, the illegitimate, the correct, the incorrect, the privileged, the marginalized, the distracted, and despised. Who are they? Us. It's us. If you can come together for lunch, you can come together to nourish those who are in despair. We got to. We've got to. Twelve states now are finding ways to inhibit people's voting rights? What has happened in the last 44 years? King died so that people could inhibit voting rights? And with the prison system meaning as soon as you come out, you have been disenfranchised. We died. We watched people beaten. We suffered. We were ridiculed for that. Today is the day when the revolution taps us on the shoulder once again. King says this also. 
power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. It's always been love. Somebody said love the enemy. But Exodus and Leviticus and all the books that we all adhere to say every alien and every stranger is your sister and your brother. Now, if you're going to sing, we shall overcome, and I know it's on the program. <laughs> Take a moment and concretely imagine what it is you're going to step into the water and confront. And when you sing it today, the roof will tremble with the power. Five years after Martin Luther King was killed in April, we had a citywide memorial at the Keele Auditorium, Keele Opera House in St. Louis. It's now called the Peabody Opera House. And I was invited to read a poem. So I did this poem. Ain't a soul amongst us who don't know for sure, Lord, Lord, that we ain't in heaven yet and our hell is standing still. Did you hear him shout, don't you get weary, don't you get weary? Like it's not we all old folks, bent and twisted from the common misery, shading our eyes with crooked fingers, palm high to the sun, looking out down the road all day. Who are we looking for? Did you hear him shout, sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, with the troubles of the world? Did you hear him, children? Did you? So much time lost since I heard him shout, since I heard him sing, since I heard him pray, since he died at supper and they took him away from us. Some nights, dark and quiet, I get to nod my head, thinking and listening once more to his big spirit-filled voice, urging us on, urging us on to victory. Then my hand starts tapping on my knee and my eyes jerk open, straining to see him up there on his mountain, pointing out the dream, pointing out so much time lost since I heard him shout. Sometimes the tears still come. Sometimes I catch myself looking out the window for a sign in the sky or something clear and certain. And what I see is that wagon. That wagon pulled by them mules and all of us, all of us, Lord, pushed down into grief where there are no words, stumbling after hoping just to make it. So much time lost. My faith is slow, rumbling like that wagon, and I'm tired, Lord, Lord, I'm tired of trying to hear him, trying to forget him. I'm tired of so much time lost, of quick pains in my hands and knees, tired of the shooting flashes in my head. Lord, Lord, we stand in here, it seems, where he left us. Looking out at Jordan, waiting for the signal to begin. Waiting for what? I heard him say, keep him moving on. I know I heard him say it. Is he crying like we are now over so much time lost? Our tears seem to make the Jordan swell its banks. Weariness, don't you stop me. I heard him say it. Lord, Lord, I heard him shout. So much time lost. We still got today. Lord, do right, Jesus. Let us take the plunge. We ain't so broken yet that we can't move a mighty distance more. Shout it, children. Shout it for him. Make Jordan shrink and tremble and move a mighty distance more. Like we heard him say, we still got today. Shout it, children. Shout it.